Thank you very much. And, and thank you to ISCO, a very precious organization. ISCO, one that I'm very proud to be associated with. And, and thank you for giving me the opportunity of sharing the story from Ireland. Uh, I, I, when, when this pandemic started to come over the horizon, I changed uh, jobs, really. I uh, took up a role as public health co-lead uh, to, to lead the response from public health perspective to this pandemic. And I'm going to share a little bit of that story with our listeners and viewers. Um, essentially, our response has been very much focused on active case finding, uh, testing uh, within the capacity of testing, which is now very adequate, but we struggled for a while, and contact tracing all cases and then all contacts. And in turn, uh, we may test them now at, at this juncture as well. Very assiduous approach to uh, surveilling outbreaks and managing them carefully. We've had the same number problem with outbreaks as many other countries have had, particularly in nursing homes. Um, and, but an early adoption of significant physical distancing issues at a societal level. I think that was a key uh, measure that we introduced, and I'll show you the dates on, on a graph shortly. Uh, we introduced them quite early. Uh, there was some debate about whether that was the right time or not, but I think uh, what I'll be able to show is that it's had the desired effect on flattening the curve. Um, we, we, we have had early targeted interventions, particularly socially vulnerable groups, about whom we were particularly concerned. Because one of the things we've noticed is that this virus cruelly exposes some of the weaknesses in how we organise our society. And uh, we sought to try to address some of that in some of the measures we've taken. So this just shows really the number of hospitalised cases, which we found is a useful measure because the number of cases is really a measure of testing. And if the testing isn't being done at large scale, then you don't, the number of cases is largely, largely affected by that. So the number of hospitalizations we found very useful to track the, uh, the progress of this uh, pandemic. Um, and you can see there uh, the various uh, points in time where various uh, changes were instituted, particularly I would say the 28th of March, when he, we introduced physical distancing. Uh, quite early, as you can see in the curve of hospitalizations, uh, but at about, we think probably in the end, end of the day, we, you know, we, we can pick this over, but probably around the right time to prevent, certainly our services were at no time uh, in any way overwhelmed by the demand that placed upon it. The next slide, I think what I'm trying to show here is uh, a slight return to normal business as well, where our ICU Cases is another measure we've been watching very closely because we've greatly increased our ICU capacity to deal with this problem. Uh, it was largely uh, COVID related uh, in around the start of April uh, and it, that's reversed now uh, as the COVID cases have reduced, the non-COVID cases have increased, showing a return of business as usual, but not, obviously not business as before. Uh, and then this is our, our, our curve for, for deaths motivated uh, notified by day. And again, shows, I think, uh, that some of our uh, projections, uh, we managed to, to, to beat those projections and uh, reduce the number of deaths, but still uh, a very saddening picture in so many ways. In terms of other issues we've been dealing with on a national level, same in, as every other country, we've been in, in the kind of global scramble for pr protective clothing and, and masks, gloves, uh, and we'll be talking more about masks obviously shortly. Uh, so that's, that, that's been a struggle, but we've, we've just about kept ahead of uh, what we've required uh, and, and people, we think we've protected our healthcare workforce reasonably well. Face masks, obviously, I won't interfere with the debate, the very well-informed debate that Trish will, will share with us. Uh, just from our perspective, where we are in relation to face masks, we have recommended that they be used in clinical settings uh, where there are interactions uh, with patients, both to protect, uh, to protect both people. Uh, and it's likely, I think, that we will recommend uses of masks in the public uh, and, and I'm interested to hear what Trish has to say about that, largely in situations where people will not be able to physically distance. Obviously, if physical distancing occurs, uh, masks aren't really uh, a huge additional advantage. So all what we really want to ensure in the debate on masks is that we don't lose sight of hand hygiene, respiratory etiquette, and physical distancing as being key measures, and that people don't become complacent. So we'll, we'll be watching for that very carefully. Uh, in terms of uh, what we've done, I mean, it's been an extraordinary experience. Everybody listening, I'm sure, has been through the same experience 24-7, uh, um, innovation, expanding ICU capacity, trying to maintain normal services. 
whole new sets of services like community-based testing in our uh, football stadia and um, community assessment hubs to try and take uh, most of COVID related work away from general practice to try and sustain normal general practice or as near normal as possible and we've opened large-scale isolation capacity for people who can't self-isolate and that's been particularly useful for vulnerable groups who live in grossly overcrowded housing uh, low-wage workers and we've been able to help them protect themselves from the worst ravages of this uh, disease. And we're also uh, opening intermediate rehab facilities. And in terms of vulnerable groups, we've, we've had a very strong focus on them, early decongregation of asylum centres, um, local outbreak teams uh, established whenever a case occurred in any of these settings, because we felt they were very vulnerable settings because of the number of people living there. And a lot of screening in those centres, and mass screening uh, on occasions, uh, even of asymptomatic people to make sure that we weren't missing any cases because of course we're afraid of asymptomatic spread. And then in terms of the migrant population, we've had a tiered approach, we've translated everything we have into multiple languages. Uh, we've prioritised um, people in vulnerable uh, housing situations to, for testing and we've worked a lot with non-governmental organisations to to get the messaging out through social media and, and other methods that, that, that people use. Um, and we're ensuring ready access to primary care as well and rapid referral to self-isolation. A lot of communication to the public uh, in all, all formats. Um, our national broadcaster made their services available to us free of charge. So we've been broadcasting our, our public health messages and our advice uh, through the newspapers, media, social media, massive social media campaign. Uh, in terms of kind of what has been felt like an extraordinary level of volunteerism, massive mobilization of staff to new roles, QI skills, are, obviously I'd be keen on this, very much at the center. Um, real danger burnout though, I mean, this is, this is uh, I don't know how many weeks we're into it now, but it's, uh, it's, it, it takes its toll, very fast paced decision-making. We've been comfortable with mistakes in a way that I think we never were before, um, and we've made mistakes. Uh, but we've had to really emphasize the need to hang on to the emphasis on compassion and kindness and need not to lose that at a time when decisions are made very fast and people's feelings are not always um, yeah, to the fore in that. So I'll hand over to Dr. Jennifer Martin now, who works with me and has been to the fore of our new contact management program. Don't worry, everybody, we are two meters apart, just for that quick crossover, the, but it was less than 15 minutes. So um, thank you very much. It's great to have an opportunity to talk to you about um, how we brought a QI approach to uh, COVID. So really, um, I think this Irish COVID-19 contact management program is a really good example of how the QI methods and the culture of QI and thinking around QI can be in some ways even more valuable in the scenario where change is even faster, even more pressurized and at an even greater scale. So I'm going to give you a real uh, case history of um, and my own personal experience of the uh, need for the establishment and now um, working in the National Contact Management Programme. So um, as you heard, um, I'm a consultant in public health medicine by background, but hadn't been working in that capacity for a long time. I'm very much a, a QI thinker now. But as the outbreak in, our, in, in Europe took off, the pressure on the departments of public health in Ireland really increased. And we were all asked anybody who had public health training, could we volunteer and go down and work in the departments? So I was down working um, in the department that happens to be in the same building as this office, maybe two or three days a week, dealing with the screening uh, with people returning from Italy, Italy and other European countries. And so I was down there when the first uh, two, two confirmed Irish cases um, occurred. And I was involved in the contact tracing of those cases. And it became really clear very quickly that we were never going to be able to scale up a contact, up contact tracing in the way it was usually done. Contact tracing, probably like many other countries here, is, has historically really relied on the professional expertise of a very small number of public health specialists in our system. We have a system that, where public health has been chronically under-resourced. Um, so, there was no way that there was going to be the capacity, the, just the basic number of staff to undertake contact tracing of what we were expecting to be thousands of cases a day. 
and also the expertise of those public health specialists was re were really being pulled um, across all the different complexities related to COVID, not just uh, contact tracing. And then we suffered from, we didn't have an IT system to support contact tracing. So um, we knew, uh, well, we, we really felt at that point in time, based on the experience from China, that contact tracing should be something that we continue to focus on. And, um, the, you know, from this Cochrane Rapid Review and elsewhere, I think people now really agree that the value of continuing contact tracing in quarantine is is high and worth doing. So um, we weren't going to be able to do it the way we were doing it. And as a QI thinker, I went back to Philip, my boss, and the rest of the QI team, and I said, look, as this scales up, I think that there is something um, that we can bring as QI thinkers to help make this process happen. And so Philip raised that with the our chief clinical officer and our CEO and our chief medical officer. And really very quickly, everybody came behind the importance of establishing a national contact management program. And there was very clear direction and mandate to do that. So uh, just to give you an idea of what we have achieved and then maybe my, my reflections on how it was achieved. So it was the 29th of February when we had the first case, well confirmed case at least, of COVID-19 in Ireland. And on the 11th of March then, the CCO <coughs> proposed that we have a central contact tracing system. Uh, so that was Wednesday. By Friday, we, uh, we started our national programme. We had army cadets. Uh, the army, of course, were first to put up their hand when we said, we need help. And they said, what can we do? And we said, okay, will you be contact tracers? So the army arrived on a Friday afternoon to the basement of Dr. Stevens Hospital. And uh, that was day one of the national contact management programme. Over an unbelievably intensive long weekend and of course our, our national holiday of St. Patrick's Day on the 17th of March, everybody worked, I would say, maybe 18 hours a day to make calls, to train the callers as, we, as they were making the calls and to design an IT system that would support that and allow it to scale. So that was Friday. By the following Wednesday, I was uploading the first case of um, co confirmed COVID onto our now national COVID care tracker system. Um, within the month, we had trained nearly 2,000 uh, non-clinical and clinical people to be contact tracers. We had established 11 contact tracing centres spread around the country, and we had the capacity to make 5,000 calls a day. Um, so that's where we are now. It's really bedding down now. It's, uh, we continue though to evolve based on new policies more than anything else. So as Philip alluded to, we really struggled with lab capacity in Ireland at, in the initial days, but now we have very good lab capacity. So as of this week, our contact tracing program has um, uh, refers all close contacts for a for a swab. And as of next week, then we will be referring any close contacts who were tested very early for an additional swab on day seven after their last contact. Other changes that are coming down the line is to allow us to flex up and down. We're looking to further automate. So we already automate certain steps of our process. We don't call people if they are negative. We send them a text. Uh, for our active follow-up, that is, which is active surveillance in another word, and um, the, the patients, and we've had good patient engagement, patients said active surveillance is just a terrible name, so we changed it. Um, but, and, um, and the other, I suppose, big um, uh, exciting uh, innovation that lots of countries are uh, working on is a contact tracing app. So um, this is a driver diagram because we think in uh, QI terms and all good projects have a driver diagram. So each of these drivers were really critical and as in all scenarios, you need to work on them all together. And we did work on them all together. Um, as, 
as Philip said, I think we had really very clear leadership and direction to do this, to resource it, to you to get as much help, any help we wanted would be given to us to set this up. We did focus on governance and that was really so important in, I mean, we were making very big decisions, maybe multiple times in a day and certainly in a week. And so to be able to um, understand where the decision making is happening and uh, to record that, I think is going to be more important in the future when people are looking back as they will to say, how well did we do things? But it has really been a help. As uh, Philip said, and I'm sure everybody's experienced this the world over, the level of collaboration and volunteerism and can-do attitude has been something I've never experienced before. And it's been, you know, an amazing privilege and experience to, to, to be part of that. The training obviously was absolutely essential. We were going from a model where we had doctors trained for, as you know, many, many years to be specialists in public health medicine, overseeing every person who was contact traced to non-clinicians, you know, volunteers who aren't even <coughs> clinicians. We had, you know, the army, civil servants, uh, universities, a wide range of people who are now going to be doing public health work having never had any public health training except what we were giving them. So the training, luckily in QI, in our national QI team, we have a lot of experience designing and delivering training. So that really stood to us and doing it in a QI way, as in multiple, multiple, multiple small tests of change. So the poor army cadets in those first days, they were doing a call, we were revising the script, they were doing it again, and it was a really interesting rapid cyclical change. Uh, soon after though, as you know, the, we, the, the country implemented social distancing measures, which were key, but did mean we couldn't deliver training face to face. And so very quickly, uh, we learned uh, great skills in delivery of online training and had support from one of our universities to use their online training platform and they continue to support that. And so it's a whole new model now. It's always online um, and interactive. The IT system then is obviously another absolutely key part of this jigsaw. We were in a space where contact tracing was, you know, largely done on paper or maybe with an Excel sheet. That worked if you were all in the same department and one person or a couple of people were doing the whole process of interviewing a case and then following up on their contacts. But we needed a system that could, one, deal with thousands of cases and tens of thousands of contacts that could, two, be used anywhere in the country. And we were very conscious in planning for social distancing and remote working. Um, and that would allow us to parse out the contact tracing process, because even here, and as Philip says, our, luckily our system hasn't become overwhelmed, but we weren't going to be able to use clinicians to be doing the whole contact tracing process because any willing and able clinician was going to the front line. So, but what we did really feel was important that a clinician is breaking bad news. So when you're picking up the phone to send, tell somebody that they have COVID-19, that that should be a clinician. So the IT system allowed us to parse out our contact tracing into separate steps advising advising the case getting the contacts from the case advising the contacts and following up those contacts and so those steps could be done anywhere in the country by anybody who we had trained we were incredibly lucky um, in terms of developing the it system on the one hand because we worked with the um our chief information officers team in the hsc who have been amazing partners um, but also that they had started already to develop a CRM or a customer relationship management system. So when we went to them, I think that was on the Wednesday, Wednesday afternoon, Brian, St. Brian really at this point, um, came out to us and said, look, what we could do is we're going to tack on a contact tracing module to the system we're already designing. So that allowed us in a period of six days to go from a drawing on my whiteboard to an actual live system. And we have continued to build on that system. Um, obviously key were the contact tracing centers. 
Um, these have been, and actually I'm going to talk to those later, the patient engagement, we didn't have time to do that at the start. It was so frenetic, but it has added real value in these latter weeks in how, particularly as we automate parts of our process, how to do that in the right way with patients and what's, what is good practice and what is bad practice. For example, we were thinking we would automate texting to speed up the process of giving results. For negatives, the feedback was absolutely quicker the better. For positives, people were saying again, can't be breaking bad news over, the, over a text, it needs to be a phone call. And that really influences our, our senior leaders and our policy makers. And then of course, the national standardized pro process that was designed and is the process that we continue to use. So really now is just to say thank you to the contact tracers who are in the, the 11 centres around the country who are volunteers from, from all different walks of, of uh, the public and private sector and for everybody who's been involved in the CMP. It really has been um, an amazing experience and you know I think is really successfully delivering what we sent, set out to do, which was to do hot, very fast, high volume, uh, low complexity contact tracing and free up the departments of public health to do the work that really only they can do where it's specialised and complex. So thank you, everybody. Thank you, Jennifer. Um, just a couple of things just to close then. Um, I hope that's been of interest to people. Uh, yeah, obviously, this is a, a global uh, webinar and it's tempting, isn't it, to compare how we're doing uh, with other countries. Uh, we, we just, I told you, I share some caveats about international comparisons. We obviously will have to make comparisons and judgments out of that and uh, there will be accountability around how we've managed all of this. But there are barriers, I think, to com comparable data uh, on incidence and prevalence because it depends a lot on, on testing. Uh, there's different methodologies in different countries for collecting and reporting data. We've seen differences in reporting of deaths, for example. Uh, we've reported all deaths, nursing homes, uh, suspected, non and, and proven, uh, but not every country has chosen to do that. So it's, it's, it's difficult to make comparisons. So I, I just cancel uh, some degree of wariness of, of simple enough comparisons between different countries. Um, just finally, really, our key learning um, uh, really is, well, first of all, uh, this has been horrible. Uh, there's no point in being kind of upbeat uh, in a situation where so many people have uh, experienced so much uh, ang angst, pain, morbidity and mortality. Uh, it's exposed, I think, the inequalities in our society here in Ireland. Um, I think uh, it's, uh, the measures we've instituted have also differentially been experienced by people in our society, it's much easier to uh, home isolate and, and achieve lockdown when you have a nice garden to walk around in and, and all of that. It, it, so it, it's it, it's it's been it's, it's been a really tough experience for Ireland. Uh, it's costing a massive price, and then we're going to have to reckon with that. Um, normal business will not return. We don't intend. We don't want it to return. Uh, we, we hope to work in a different way, but we'll have to work in some ways very, very differently to before. I think everybody knows what I mean by, when I say that. And um, we do really need to work to protect non-COVID care. We don't want people dying of cancer, heart disease, stroke, uh, unnecessarily, if we can protect them and save, save their lives. Uh, we don't want fear of attending health services to, to curtail that possibility. Uh, we all know kind of what works, the, the, the measures, uh, we're really going to keep hammering away at those, particularly as we relax some of our social measures, which we have done over the last week. Um, and uh, we, human behaviour is going to be the, the key in all of this, though, because it's not so much the relaxing of the measures that will have the impact on, on uh, numbers of cases. It will be how people change their behaviour in response to those relaxations. Will they stop thinking that physical distancing is still very important? Uh, hopefully not, but we will certainly be hammering that message uh, to, our, to, to the greatest degree that we can. The real problem, of course, is that asymptomatic people appear to be infective, uh, pre-symptomatic and asymptomatic. That's really creates the control uh, challenge. Um, but we're not going back to old ways of working. We intend to learn a lot from what we've done and apply it to all kinds of new challenges into the future. 
And uh, really, uh, we, we, we don't know where the road is taking us, um, but we uh, feel at least we've, we've, if you like, survived the first wave. Our health services have stood up to the challenge and uh, we've made mistakes, uh, but we, uh, we've, we've had some successes as well. So listen, thank you very much for listening. Uh, I really appreciate the opportunity to share that with you. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you so much, Philip and Jennifer, as, uh, for a fantastic insight into the situation in Ireland and also the learnings and, and looking forward. That's brilliant. Um, yeah, we're, we're going to hand over to Trish now. Um, Trish, are you? OK, we'll, we'll. Yeah, I'm good. I'm here. Oh, so let me explain uh, what this is all about. You know, I was never an expert on masks. I was, a, a, you know, if anything, I was an expert on rapid reviews and we set up a rapid review service at Oxford. And one of the things we got asked to look at was masks for the public or face coverings. Now, uh, something interesting happened right at the beginning there, which was that Carl Hennigan, uh, who's the uh, professor of evidence-based medicine at Oxford and myself, uh, looked at the evidence and we came to diametrically opposing conclusions. So Carl decided the evidence... Uh, um, didn't support uh, the wearing of masks by the public and I felt that it did. So what I'm going to present to you today is, is a case study uh, of how evidence is valued. Um, and I guess looking back as, as a social scientist um, who's quite interested in, in the way evidence is interpreted, uh, I was quite interested in these two competing narratives that were based on the same evidence. So on the, on the one hand, there was a story that, that masks by, for the public should be policy because the evidence base is strong, uh, because it's common sense, and also in the precautionary principle, uh, we have a moral imperative to act if, if mask wearing would even make a, a small contribution because the problem was so serious. And on the other hand, we had uh, an opposing narrative which said it shouldn't be policy because the evidence base is weak, that harms could occur, and that uh, the ethical thing to do would be to wait for more research before we took an action. So, so those people were also using the precautionary principle. So this was all very interesting. And, and I would emphasize again that nobody disputed what the evidence was. It was actually how it was valued that was, um, that, that was the, the uh, sticking point. Now, I was one of a, a, a group of people that were publishing that masks and face coverings should be policy. We published a paper in the British Medical Journal. There's another paper I've written, which is going to be out any day in the Journal of Evaluation of Clinical Practice. Um, the Royal Society in the UK came out in favour. JAMA was in favour. So, so lots of things in favour. So, so what, were they, what were those people, myself included, arguing? And the first thing we were arguing was that laboratory evidence uh, is evidence and should be taken account of. Uh, and many of you will have seen these very dramatic pictures of people coughing and sneezing uh, in these special chambers that light up the droplets. Uh, and New England Journal were publishing this. Uh, and we were saying, look, this, this has to be included. This has to be included. Uh, it wasn't a randomized controlled trial, of course. It was simply pictures of the droplets, the respiratory virus, uh, SARS-CoV-2 is known to sit in these droplets and the idea was that if you place a, a, a cloth covering over the face uh, far far fewer droplets come out so, so pretty basic stuff. Uh, the second argument uh, was that um, this is all about source control, this is all about covering the mouth from uh, in other words stopping the source of the droplet so you don't wear a mask primarily to protect yourself, you wear it to protect other people from your droplets. And this rather uh, incredible graph here, I'll talk you through it, on, on the horizontal axis is the efficacy of the mask. We all know the cloth mask isn't 100% uh, efficient, uh, but it doesn't have to be, that's the point. It, uh, it can be, for example, 70 or 60% uh, effective. And then on the vertical axis, the adherence, the proportion of the public that wears the mask. 
We know that some people either can't or won't wear masks, that they might be traumatized by it if they've got, you know, claustrophobia or, or asthma or learning difficulties. All right. So put those aside and let's say, for example, that 70 percent of the public will uh, wear one reasonably willingly. Uh, so if you have a 70 percent of the public wearing them and uh, they're 70 percent efficient, you get into the blue zone. And the blue zone is the zone where the effective R naught goes below one. Uh, so you can see the contour line there. So, so this kind of mathematical modeling uh, based on assumptions about the proportion who wear and, and, and how ef effective. So that was the second lot of evidence. Uh, the third argument was uh, about stories. Uh, stories of cruise ships, stories of choir practice, uh, where uh, lots and lots of people seemed to uh, develop the virus, uh, the R naught apparently on the Diamond Princess was 11, I heard, so it did changes in, in different circumstances. And there's this lovely quote, when do uh, these super spreader events happen? Whenever and wherever people are up in each other's faces, laughing, shouting, cheering, sobbing, singing, greeting and praying. Uh, now that's not uh, science really, that was a story in the press. Uh, and it's all been pulled together in um, uh, blogs and newspaper articles. So in this narrative, we were arguing that this, these stories should be collated and factored into the decision making. Uh, people like Carl Hennigan didn't, uh, didn't agree with us, but I'll, I'll come to him in a minute. And uh, the next uh, type of evidence was natural experiments. And you may have seen these uh, graphs from um, John Byrne Murdoch at the Financial Times, where you've got uh, each country, uh, we start on day one, I think it is, or it might be the, day, the, the tenth case or something like that, but they're all, they're all sort of dragged to the same benchmark. Uh, and then it's the number of cases uh, cumulatively over time. Uh, and someone sort of scribbled on it here and shown that the countries that introduced mask wearing early on uh, had much lower peaks and, and controlled the pandemic. And of course, uh, you can argue all sorts of things about that. Uh, for example, they introduced other measures in addition to the mask wearing. So, so the, the question is just how much weight we put on this evidence, particularly the scribbles on the graph, which don't look at all scientific. Nevertheless, uh, they do raise questions. Okay. So here's the counter narrative that masks and face coverings should not be policy. Um, and when I made these slides a few days ago, I couldn't actually find anything that had got beyond the preprint stage. I couldn't find any peer reviewed papers. Uh, I think there may be some now. These, these are all uh, quite uh, interesting papers. I, I don't agree with them, but they're, they're all, um, they're certainly the Julian Brainard paper is a, is a systematic review. Tom Jefferson, I think is a Cochrane review. Um, so these were presenting different arguments. So the first argument they were presenting was that there is no strong evidence from randomized controlled trials. Uh, and one of the issues here is that there's never actually been a randomized controlled trial of masks or face coverings worn by the lay public for source control during a respiratory pandemic. Uh, people have claimed there have been these trials, but there haven't. What, what they, the randomized trials have been uh, on is either health professionals in hospitals or clinics, uh, people on airplanes, university students in halls of residence, uh, occupational exposures such as people in poultry factories, the carers of small children with, with fevers and, and respiratory um, problems, respiratory illness, or pilgrims to the Hajj. So, so very specific cases uh, where they can actually take a sample of people and randomize them. But this, none of these were, uh, you know, everybody should be wearing a mask type, type trials. They, they, they simply haven't been done. So that was a complete uh, absence of evidence there. And of course, absence of evidence is not evidence of absence. We don't have randomized trials, for example, of handkerchiefs. We don't have randomized trials of um, social distancing. So it was very interesting that, that in the mask argument, uh, many scientists were arguing for randomized trials, but other public health measures for the, for the uh, population were not uh, being uh, presented in the same way. 
The second argument uh, was that the general public are not going to wear masks properly. Uh, and you can see these three examples that I, I took from Google Images of uh, one's actually Cindy Lam, a politician from Hong Kong, uh, sort of having a nose hanging out of, of a mask, which isn't, isn't much good. And then there's a chap, uh, unfortunately, wearing an N95 mask and he's got his baby uh, not wearing a mask, which is which is right, you know, under two shouldn't be wearing them, uh, but, but but a big sort of plastic cover, and then someone just sort of touching and fiddling with the mask, and, and the idea is, look, hang on a minute, this, is, this isn't really good practice. Um, and of course, the counter argument there is, it, you know, all you've got to do really is put out some decent public health advice about how to fit one, how to wear one, what not to do with one, and make sure that that message is got across consistently. So there's things we can talk about there, maybe. Uh, public information campaign, absolutely essential if this is going to work. Um, the next argument put forward by the anti-mask uh, people is uh, the harms that could happen. And the most obvious one is the shortage of PPE. Um, if there's a run on particularly N95 uh, FFP2 masks, uh, also discarding of, of contaminated masks, and, and I can see these now in the street, people wear them for a bit and then just throw them away, but also the idea that masks might cause um, skin damage, for example. Um, I know they, they itch, I used to wear them myself when I was a clinician. Uh, so is this an argument for not, um, not promoting them at all? And of course, the counter argument to that is that, hang on a minute, you, you know, that you can make your own out of an old T-shirt. You don't even need a sewing machine. Uh, they're rather colourful. They're rather fun if you, you could sort of express your creativity. Um, and I, I just put here um, a response I gave to a journalist, actually, who asked me, should the public be wearing cloth masks or finding medical ones? And I said it's far better to use a cloth mask than medical masks are not designed for comfort, they're designed for very short-term use, um, but also you use a handkerchief to sneeze into, not, not a piece of cardboard. So actually cotton cloth is actually a pretty good thing for putting over your, your nose and mouth. Um, again, we need public information rather than just a, a, an instruction or, or a, a recommendation. The next argument put forward by the anti-mask uh, people is that there is something called risk compensation. And they've put together these models where you, you have a perception of risk. And then you can see this little mouse here who's wearing a helmet. And the idea is because he's wearing a helmet, like a ski helmet or a motorcycle helmet, he's going to take more risks trying to get that cheese. Uh, and you can see this lovely piece of graffiti here, the, the, this assumption that the, the woman who's wearing the mask will now take more risks, for example, with social distancing or fail to wash her hands. Uh, there's no evidence whatsoever that this risk compensation actually occurs, but it is speculated upon an awful lot. Um, and I think the, the graffiti really does uh, illustrate uh, 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 the assumption around that. Um, the fifth argument I've heard is that masks are a middle class privilege. These two ladies are apparently celebrities. I don't know who they are, but they're wearing very expensive designer masks. And you can see how, uh, you know, how kind of beautiful and charming they've made them look. Uh, and the worry is, of course, that uh, the less privileged people won't be able to afford them. Um, actually, of course, um, not getting COVID is uh, a middle-class privilege. And uh, I think this idea that, that we shouldn't be presenting uh, masks uh, just because some people may not be able to afford those particularly posh ones, it, it's a bit weird because I, I'm also um, worried about, uh, you know, uh, social inequalities. I've done research on it for 30 years. Uh, I, I, on, on the right-hand side of the slide is, is a picture of some masks in a South African mask-making co-op uh, I think the co-op is, is, is working, uh, you know, they're not all in the same room, obviously. Uh, and here we've got a, a queue in public transport because uh, actually it's only the middle classes that drive to work. You know, those who go on public transport are going to need uh, better protection. Uh, so I think the arguments of middle class privilege don't, don't really hold water too much. I think that masks can reduce inequality. Uh, and the next argument, I've got my numbering slightly awry here. 
the civil liberties argument. Uh, Donald Trump, perhaps the most famous, refused Nick for wearing masks. He's too important to wear a mask and he doesn't feel like he has to. And this appropriation of the slogan, my body, my choice, uh, by some, uh, some campaigners, particularly in America, um, of course, the counter argument to that is that, that rights uh, are balanced by responsibilities and that some people are more vulnerable than others. And, and I speak as a cancer survivor. I was one of those patients receiving chemotherapy. I went to get my chemotherapy on public transport uh, and I have had two episodes of neutropenic sepsis, which were both life threatening. So I know about this and I would say thank you for wearing your mask. I'll be wearing my mask, which will protect you. Um, I think in these quite unprecedented times, uh, mask wearing can be depicted as a social duty. Uh, okay, so I would just sum up. There are some competing value hierarchies here, which I think are worth examining. Uh, the arguments that, that mask wearing should be policy, I would say are based on a more theory-driven approach that, that rigor can embrace a very wide range of methods, including things like stories uh, which call for explanation. Uh, I think stories can improve our scientific understanding, ignite our moral imagination, even without uh, specific uh, so-called rigorous scientific studies. But I do acknowledge that the arguments that the masks should not be policy uh, are based on Another definition of rigor, uh, which is heavily focused on randomized controlled trials and uh, the idea that we shouldn't really be taking too much notice of anecdote and speculation. However, I'd also say that, that uh, people making those arguments seem to be allowing their own anecdotes uh, and their own speculations, such as arguments about, well, I saw someone touching their mask or uh, what if uh, risk compensation occurs. So. That's probably enough on masks. I uh, hope you've enjoyed the pictures uh, and I look forward to having some discussion. Excellent, thank you so much Trish. Uh, fantastic presentation. And again, thanks to, to Philip and Jennifer as well. Um, really, really good um, presentation of facts there and information and um, I suppose hopefully common sense will prevail in a lot of, um, a lot of situations. Um, and also just, just looking at the comments here throughout, fantastic comments for, for all the presenters today. Uh, really, really good. I, I'm not sure if you're able to keep an eye on the chat box as you're presenting, but it's uh, lovely comments coming through there too. It's great to see, um, just before we go into our Q&A, sorry, um, what we're going to do is we'll try and get through as many questions as possible. I'll invite everyone now to, to start thinking about their questions and, and typing them in. And also if there are questions in the Q&A box that you see, that you'd like to see, um, answered or prioritized, you can upvote them as well. So what I'll do is I'll start from the top and I'll, um, I'll work my way down. So while you're typing your questions at the moment, I'm just going to say, if you enjoyed today's presentation and found it helpful, then please check out our COVID resources page. We've collated resources from all around the world on the ISCO website that are re relevant, relevant to all different backgrounds and contact texts. There's plenty of resources there that's useful for everyone. So please check it out and share it with anyone you think may benefit from them. And also one of, the, one of the positives to come out of this whole situation is to see the strength of the community, the, both the ISCO community and the global healthcare community, community in general. And it's fantastic to see so many ISCO members and fellows on here today. And if you're not already maybe an ISCO member, then we, we please maybe say, ask if you would consider joining just to help us to continue what we're doing at the moment in, this, uh, in a difficult time. So, okay, we'll, we'll jump into the Q&A then. I'll have a quick look here. So our first question here is from Chidunga. So what advice will you give countries without a robust IT system to do patient notification and contract, contact tracing effectively? Um, so I suppose um, our, we had no IT system for this. Obviously, maybe we had some more capacity than others, but um, if you had the internet working at all, that was pretty much what we were relying on. The CRM is a Microsoft um, um, platform that I'm sure they're interested to share elsewhere. And then a lot of what we're relying on now is mobile phones. So it mightn't require as much I think as as 
we would have thought before. Normally, it takes us years to get an IT system up and running that's perfect. But uh, we built on a very basic model from, uh, you know, clearly a, a private provider and it's worked very sufficiently well. Excellent. Thank you, Jennifer. Our next question from Peter saying, given that the UK is about to set up contact tracing, what is the key message and advice that you would give? Is it just to keep it simple and keep it local? Uh, well, it's interesting because it's, it's, we're at an interesting phase now, certainly in Ireland, we're not identifying so many cases. So the, the machine that we built up is, is idling a little bit because we, we don't have so many contacts to trace. But what I would say is, it, I, I really welcome the fact that the UK is adopting uh, this approach to identifying cases and, and tracing the contacts, because I think it, all the evidence suggests that, that will help control the spread of this virus very effectively, masks notwithstanding. So I think uh, really welcome that, that move. Great, thanks, Philip. Our next question is from Dr. Kunal. This is a, a two-part question, one relating to, the, to airspace. So do you think it would have been a good idea to, to close off airspace entirely from January 1st, uh, when we started hearing about the, the disease coming through in November, December? And um, uh, the second part of the question is, what are the percentages of lung tissue damages that have been seen recovered in recovered cases um, from throughout the nation? Um, Trish, do you want to go first for that one and I come in then? Yeah, I, I think it's really, hard. first of all, the lung tissue damage, I'm, I'm pretty sure we do not have that data yet. I've been sort of vaguely monitoring what's going on, but you know, the, the long term follow ups, uh, all the studies so far are not really very long term and they have questionable denominators. So, for example, the, the, the denominator population is from an intensive care unit. But wait a minute, most people don't end up in an intensive care unit. So I think we do need to wait a little bit. I was emailing um, a respiratory physician last night who says he's got a cohort of about 1500 patients. that He is beginning to follow up and he's getting some very interesting data on prolonged tiredness as, as, as a kind of marker for, for, for uh, lung, lung damage. But I just think it's too early. Um, in terms of closing airspace, this isn't, this isn't an area of my expertise. I'd be interested in what others think. You know, one or two countries did, uh, they did well, but I think it's all very easy to look through the retrospectoscope and say, well, now we know what happened. This is what we should have done. But the trouble is he didn't know that on the 1st of January. So, uh, you know, were the ones who closed their airspace lucky? Because it's a pretty risky thing to do for all sorts of other reasons. Uh, that's all I've got to say. Over to you, uh, Philip and Jenny. Thanks, Tricia. I mean, I think, uh, yeah, certainly emerging evidence of long-term sequelae for particularly, as Trish says, those who've uh, had the misfortune of ending up in the intensive care unit. Uh, it'll be different for people who, 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 who didn't have have to go through that experience. But in terms of closing airspace, um, we, as an island, we didn't feel we were able to close our airspace. We rely on uh, workers coming in to work in our, in our services, in our, uh, in our economy. We rely on goods coming in. Obviously, that doesn't really hold very much risk. So we didn't feel we could close our airspace. But what we are doing is we're, we're proposing that anybody who travels out outside of Ireland or comes into Ireland, so if any of us travel out or anybody seeks to travel in, they need to isolate themselves for 14 days, quarantine themselves for 14 days. So that'll put a very effective break on travel, I can tell you. Um, so, uh, so, so really, yeah, we, we, we didn't feel we could close our airspace. Excellent, thanks Trisha and thanks Philip. So let me see now. Our next question, Chan, Chandrakant has asked, is it worth now to do contact tracing in the US, do you think? Um, I'd start here, Trish might, might come in. Um, yeah, I, I, I'd say certainly it is. At any stage of the epidemic curve, uh, it, it's, 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 it's good practice to identify close contacts, because certainly what we found, we've done a few mass testing exercises of asymptomatic people, and we found very low rates of infection, even in nursing homes where we carried out uh, some of the testing. 
Uh, but the one thing, the one group that we find consistently higher rates of positivity are in close contacts. So um, that, that says to us, that's why we've adopted an approach to testing close contacts, even when they're asymptomatic, uh, which is not something that most countries are doing. And it, it's an experiment. But uh, yes, I, I think the US should press on with it. And another thing just to add in, I think um, contact tracing programs are even more important if you want to free up society. Because when you're in the scenario, as we have been in Ireland, of the whole country in lockdown, you're really only going to have, uh, we, we are down to less than three close contacts per case. But to allow us to open up society, we want to be able to um, test people really quickly, contact their kids their contacts really quickly and put them into, into quarantine. So I think it's even more important than that. Point, yeah. Just to chip in, I 100% I, I agree with that. But I, what I would say is, I, I, be, I was so impressed with your presentation, um, Philip and Jenny. You know that you've you've kind of joined it all up in a way that I'm concerned isn't yet getting done in certainly in England. Um, one of the things that we really need to make sure of is that testing and tracking and tracing are all integrated. Um, if the testing uh, for example, a colleague of mine waited 15 days to get the result of a test. Now, I think people are not going to have the patience to self-isolate for that long when they've actually got a relatively low risk of being positive. We want the tests to come back within hours, not days or weeks, and then close contact tracing. Uh, but yeah, I think it's, it's, it's a crucial element uh, and uh, it's one of the ways that we're going to get the economy back up and running as you're saying Jenny you know that that having the having everyone in lockdown means that that people in manual jobs can't get to work people working in the gig economy are not getting any income all that kind of thing so so yeah absolutely test track trace brilliant thanks to everyone there this is an interesting one, Trish. Uh, I'll direct it to you. Uh, do the police have a view on using face masks uh, where it could reduce the effectiveness of CCTV or, or es essentially help crime? Uh, it's speculative, isn't it? Um, I know people who are saying, uh, you know, oh, the public wouldn't know how to cover their faces. And you think, well, if you wanted to be a burglar, you know how to cover your face. My kids used to play pirates. They were perfectly capable at the age of six or seven of tying a rag around their face, you know, that kind of thing. Um, I've just helped to write a report for the World Health Organization on the social and cultural aspects of uh, face coverings and masks. I'm working with anthropologists and the idea that wearing a mask is a, a symbol of something sinister. You're pretending to be something you're not or you're trying to hide something. So you're either hiding your identity um, or you're putting on those sort of Halloween masks that we wear from time to time to, to, to depict yourself as being someone else. Uh, yes, all right. What I would say is you can, that's all very quirky, but once something acquires a new meaning in society, I think society adapts very quickly. And we have seen this very dramatically uh, in various countries around the world where suddenly it's actually quite reassuring to see other people wearing a face covering because wearing that face covering now means we are safer, whereas, before we were in the midst of a pandemic, someone wearing a face covering might have meant I'm a bank robber or, you know, I'm in a carnival or whatever it might be. But I think we are adapting and we're realising that this is now a symbol of safety. It's something reassuring. So I don't think uh, it's not so much the police, uh, perhaps, but it's the, the sort of enforcers of the law or the people who might want to. I think one of the things we've got to worry about, though, is the stigmatization either of people who are wearing masks or the people who are not wearing masks. So I get stopped sometimes if I'm wearing one in a public place by people who say, there's no need to wear that, you really shouldn't be you know, spreading fear. Uh, but equally, people who are not wearing masks are also being collared and told, hang on a minute, you're putting my child at risk or whatever. I think that's why we need a very clear public information campaign not just about the, the potential benefits of masks, but also 
uh, to say, well, you know, if someone's not wearing one, can you can you not attack them? Uh, they may they may have a reason. Actually, it's okay if ninety percent of us wear them and just leave the other ten percent out of it. Uh, that's my view. I'm a bit of a libertarian here. I, 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 I'm not a great one for mandatory masks, but I, I rather suspect we'll come we'll come to it. I, I Trish, that's interesting because I, I do think stigmatization is an issue and and is very likely. You know, those who who feel they can't wear a mask for long periods of time could be uh, the subject of opprobrium. The the one of the things I think about mass mask wearing is. It's, it has a social impact, a social cost as well. A lot of people find it very hard to hear and communicate. It's, it's another barrier in this already very stultified environment that we've created for ourselves because we've had to do it to, to protect us, ourselves from spread. And what I, what I hope it doesn't do is create false reassurance. And I know you, you referred to that already in your paper. Uh, and and I, I, what I really believe is, I, I, I don't believe prolonged mask wearing is very effective because I think people can't do it for all day. It's horrible. I, I mean, I, I wear a mask clinically and I, it's, a, it's a significant impediment when I'm looking after my patients. They can't hear me. Uh, you know, it, it's, 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 it's not a nice thing to do wearing a mask, I don't think. Some people may enjoy it. But, uh, so therefore, I think it's really targeted use of masks in environments where you're likely to be unable to physically distance. That's what I'd be in favor of. Yeah, I would agree. I'd absolutely agree with you, Philip. I, I, I totally agree. I love um, coming home and taking it off. Um, and I think this idea that we're going to be able to make everyone wear them, it, it's not, um, it's just not tenable. But of course, the mathematics are that if you're in a place where there's 100 people, like a tube train, you really need one. If you're walking your dog, you need it much less. And I think we need to get that across. Excellent. Thank you so much. Um... I'm just looking at the time, guys. We're, we're gone the hour. I know we're, we're dealing with very busy schedules here, so I'm conscious of not running over time. So I think we'll wrap it up there.